Well, shortly after 9-11, I found out, much to my horror, that at the highest levels of the government, actually at the White House, that they had willfully and deliberately violated the Constitution and the Fourth, the fourth Amendment, and in particular the statute that governed uh, any kind of surveillance that would be conducted against U.S. persons, and that was all governed by, and that was all governed by the Foreign Intelligence Surveillance Act. Okay. I also, well, during those, those, those months after 9-11, it wasn't just the secret surveillance program uh, that came into being in the deepest of secrecy, uh, and which to this day remains quite secret. In fact, the uh, original executive uh, directive that Bush signed into law, well, signed into law, he just signed it. Okay, let's put it that way. Let me back up, sorry. Um, the original directive, the uh took place in the first week in October. But I was also, um, I was also exposed to massive multi-billion dollar fraud, waste, and abuse with respect to the Trailblazer program, which at the time was NSA's flagship uh, program to deal with the challenges of the 1990s in the digital age. How do you make sense of massive amounts of data? And it was a multi-billion dollar program. Uh, I was also exposed uh, directly to what NSA should have known, could have known, or did know, and did not share. And that if it had been shared, uh, could have very well prevented 9-11, which in itself was quite explosive just simply the knowledge of what NSA had kept from those who could have taken the necessary action to s prevent the threat. And so that's, you know, that's dirty knowledge that I carry with me to this day. So when you're faced with that kind of, of subversion of the Constitution, uh, which was in violation of the prime directive at NSA, because of all the abuses during the 50s and 60s and 70s culminating in the two permanent standing committees on intelligence as well as the FISA Act under the Carter administration. I mean, that was the era in which I was a very young teenager uh, recognizing that you know, even the government can get out of whack. Uh, that was the checks and balances in action. I never imagined what I was be confronted with 23 years later. And so I could not remain silent. If I had remained silent and looked the other way, I would have been complicit or an accessory to a crime. That crime was, was subversion of the Constitution. And so I chose to speak up uh, with, within the intelligence um, community system. And the first thing I did is I went to my immediate chain of command. And it was during the course of going to my chain of command to include my uh, direct supervisor, the number three person at the National Security Agency, Maureen Baginski, uh, that um, I discovered precisely what the nature and the contours were um, of the secret surveillance program, culminating in a rather dramatic phone call that I had with the lead attorney uh, at the uh, National Security Agency um, in the Office of General Counsel, who stated it very, very clear uh, that the White House uh, um, had approved the program, it was all legal, and that NSA was now the executive agent. As soon as I heard that, I realized that we had crossed the Rubicon, and that strategic des decision that had made at the highest levels of the government and the greatest of secrecy was opening up a Pandora's box and would have both intended and unintended consequences later. But NSA also doubled down on the Trailblazer program after 9-11, a flagship program that was started in the spring of 2000. And um, even more and more billions were spent on that program. It ultimately died an ignominious death in 2006, having never um, developed or delivered anything. Well, Thin Thread was an extraordinary program that I became familiar with. Um, during the course of all this, uh, after 9-11, after the call had gone out from George Tenet, uh, just within, we we're talking within days, to put, anything we had, to put anything we had into the fight. I don't care what it is, it doesn't, it doesn't have to be finished, we just need it. And I was actually charged at NSA with going to the ends of NSA to find those programs. There was a number of programs that I found, and one of them was Synthread. ThinThread uh, had been developed by an extraordinary uh, group of about a dozen plus government employees and a small number of contractors, and it actually had met the challenge that NSA faced. And how do you make sense um, 
of anything. How do you get the nuggets of information from the vast amounts of data that are being flowed across multiple lines of communication and all of the, uh, the internet infrastructure um, in this information age? Well, it was very different in that it actually, not only did it make sense of the intelligence, but it kept track of it in real time. And fundamentally, and this was critical in terms of the post-9-11 post um, security uh, era, it also fundamentally protected the Fourth Amendment rights uh, of Americans. They were not violated. Unfortunately, that's not what happened with the Secret Surveillance Program. They actually took a segment of the, of the Thin Thread Program and ensured that all of the safeguards were stripped so they could have unfettered access to just about anything that was digital um, in the United States, not just foreign, but U.S. to U.S. communications, uh, starting with all telephone calls and then rapidly including uh, all other forms of communication between uh, U.S. persons or resident legal aliens or even U.S. corporations. Well, <laughs> I mean, this is one of the things I have not talked about in detail. Um, let's just say that they did not appreciate uh, having this information brought to their attention. Um, but they were probably the most, the most, uh, they probably reacted the worst with respect to my holding the mirror up when I flat out said, what are we doing violating the Constitution? Don't you know there's a legal means by which you can change the law if it's not working? And we go to Congress to do that. And then I heard another chilling statement. If we go to Congress with what we want to do and are doing, they will say no. And then I said, this is, this is, 9-11 has just happened. They'll practically sign off on anything. Not with this. We just want the data. We never know when we're, we might need it. We just want the data. And so what began is this vast Leviathan surveillance system that really had no constraints. We had unchained, un, uh, the government had unchained itself from the Constitution, one of the fundamental amendments that protects the rights of, of U.S. citizens and U.S. persons from, their, from having their person violated as well as their papers and, and effects taken. And the only way you can do that legally is you have to show probable cause with an affidavit before the third branch of government. They completely bypassed the 23-year legal regime that had governed all of that because of all those abuses in those earlier decades. But that didn't matter. Didn't matter at all. Well, the secret surveillance program in particular was, was extreme, I mean, it was extremely uh, closely held. I mean, I can't, even, I can't overemphasize that. We're only talking a few dozen people would have even been read in, as I say, into the program. I became aware of the program by, from various people and various sources, uh, as well as direct knowledge. And the, later when the James Risen and Eric Lichtblau article came out in the New York Times, uh, that was quite explosive. And that was really the first time that the vast majority of those who are assigned to NSA, whether civilian or military, and that's tens of thousands of employees, found out uh, about what NSA had been up to f at that point for well over uh, four years in the deepest of secrecy. And it raised all kinds of questions. Now, of course, I heard all those questions when people were coming to me in private with the direct uh, material evidence um, for the illegality, the massive illegality, uh, in which Americans, you know, phone calls and emails and all other forms of electronic communication were increasingly being caught up. Because what NSA did is, well, NSA's mission is historically always outward facing, dealing with foreign intelligence. It was never designed, although it was severely abused during the 60s and 70s politically, to go after dissidents, war protesters, and even journalists and reporters. But if you take that power, as the Church Committee warned in, in, um, in 1975, what happens with more advanced technology? Would, would we be able to come back across that bridge once crossed? It was an open question, and the question was rhetorically answered. We, we might not have that ability. That we would have, so, have such 
have gone so far in subverting the Constitution that essentially we would now have revoked the fundamental foundation of our form of governance and the Constitution Republic. And uh, it was a warning. It was a warning to the nation. Here I was, eyewitness uh, to, to the worst nightmares that I could possibly imagine. Not only had we gotten out or actually left the vehicle, the constitutional vehicle, the rule of law, we were now in a vehicle, the wheels that come off that, we were now in a vehicle that was alien to me. I did not recognize that, that form of government. It's also important to understand in terms of my own background, why was this a particular concern to me, at I mean, the gravest of concerns. During the latter years of the Cold War, I flew on RC-135s, on RC-135s as a crypto-linguist, voice processing specialist, a reconnaissance platform. We were one of the vacuum cleaners of the skies in terms of electronic intelligence and communications intelligence, otherwise known as SIGINT, signals intelligence. The target country of interest in which I spent most of my four years overseas on that particular airborne platform, the, the country in which I became an expert was East Germany, a fascist surveillance state. I never imagined that the extraordinary uh, or the monstrous efficiency of the Stasi in keeping records on practically everything in all things about their citizens of 16 to 17 million, that, that that entire regime would actually be what I was faced with in those short weeks and months uh, after 9-11. And so I became a material witness. I, I blew every whistle I could think of within the system at NSA, but then I actually, under the Intelligence Community Whistleblower Protection Act of 1998, I went to Congress. And uh, which was at great peril because NSA was monitoring those who would have any contact outside of NSA, but particularly with Congress, and particularly with anybody assigned to the oversight committees. I made direct contact in those early weeks after 9-11 and told them what I knew that NSA was doing in direct collaboration and approval from the White House. And I knew it was absolutely in violation of the Constitution, and it would raise the gravest concerns about what this meant going forward and all under the excuse of 9-11. Of what I was told when I confronted my uh, superiors in the, chain of command at NSA, in the chain of command at NSA is you don't understand, Mr. Drake. We live in very different times now because of 9-11. We live in exigent conditions, and that requires extraordinary means to deal with it. And so, you know, if we violate the rights you know, of Americans, so be it, because we need to make Americans feel safe again. So we'll sacrifice, we'll sacrifice some, of, some of our rights and freedoms for the sake of security. And as soon as I heard that, the first thing I was remember those, those famous words attributed to Benjamin Franklin. Right. Yeah. Well, I'm just paraphrasing him. You, know, you want to sacrifice a little liberty for security, or what he actually said was safety, you'll lose both. And it was, that was his warning, his warning to the nation. Our national security is fundamentally premised um, on our rights and freedoms, and those are enshrined in the, the first 10 amendments of the Constitution, which is the Bill of Rights. And so it was just, so I ended up two 9-11 congressional investigations. Um, and what I blew the whistle on under the Intelligence Community Whistleblower Protection Act were those three things I mentioned earlier. The secret surveillance program, everything I knew, I gave to them. Although, as I found out later, it was completely censored. It was as if that history never existed. I, there's no record anywhere of what I gave them, and I gave them a lot. The multi-billion dollar fraud, waste, and abuse called Trailblazer, and the fact that there was a system called ThinThread, as well as some other associated systems, that not only provided and had proven their ability to, to, to give superior intelligence to the nation, early indications and warning to the nation, but also fundamentally protected the Fourth Amendment rights of U.S. persons. And yet, that was a $3 million program versus what was originally a $4 billion program, which became even more after 9-11, and yet that, that program was completely disbanded. And it effectively went into the NSA Indiana Jones data warehouse, never to be seen again. I also blew the whistle on what NSA knew, could have known, or should have known, or had never discovered in their own vast databases with respect to 9-11. And it's probably, of all the things, obviously beyond the, the willful and deliberate violation of the Constitution, 
and the massive fraud, waste, and abuse in terms of, and violating, by the way, the federal acquisition uh, regulation, the FAR, right? And, and I gave all that information. But the thing I think in many respects that really s was stuck in my craw was the fact, was the incalculable loss of intelligence because they deliberately with, uh, prevented thin thread from being put into the fight. And that was actually in, in direct contra uh, contradiction to George Tennant, who at the time was the director of central intelligence, uh, or essentially his mandate to put anything into the fight to deal with the threat. Um, and so that loss, the very best of American ingenuity innovation, was never given a chance at all. And so it died, you know, it died in the late winter, early spring of 2002. One of my last, uh, I became the executive program manager for ThinThread um, um, in November of 2001. And I did everything I could to put NSA in, into the fight operationally. I was, I was blocked at every turn. I was able to wrestle a couple million dollars and, and have ThinThread and all, and all of its extraordinary capability point at least toward the databases of NSA. What we discovered in early 2002 was incredibly shocking. We actually found actual intelligence pre and post 9-11 that NSA had never discovered. And we reported it in the entire program and the report was buried deep. The evidence, it was material evidence, all evidence, actionable intelligence regarding the threat and if that had been shared with critical people that could have made a difference early on before Al-Qaeda and other associated movements metastasized uh, with respect to you know our own our own foreign policies and a projection of military power we could have easily have have pre-9-11 rolled up the threat and prevented 9-11 from even happening just with what NSA itself knew or could have known and didn't share when it knew what it had regarding the threat but also the critical intelligence that was available they didn't know they had even after 9-11. That entire program was disbanded. It was a severe embarrassment. I, just, I mean, it's, even when I reflect back now on, you know, that's 2002, it's over 11 years ago. It's an extraordinary burden because it's, it's what could have been, what could have been with the best that America had invented to provide for the common Well, so between the fall of 2001 and early 2006, I had worked as best I could within the system. The other avenue that I, that I went to, I became part of a DOD hotline complaint that was actually submitted uh, in early September of 2002 regarding the requirements for Trailblazer and ThinThread. And I was the unnamed senior official that was mentioned directly in that uh, hotline complaint. That complaint uh, actually initiated a multi-year investigation, audit slash investigation by the Department of Defense Office of Inspector General. I became by the significant material witness over a number of years uh, for, for that audit investigation, giving, giving the auditors and investigators tens of thousands of pages of documents on all aspects of thin thread and trailblazer management control systems uh, the financial records uh, pro program details and what it meant not to have thin thread in the fight and so made many many trips uh, over there unfortunately because nsa w found out who was cooperating as material witnesses uh, for for that audit and investigation i came under uh, surveillance, I have to say it that way, from within NSA. And let's just say that administrative and bureaucratically, life became very difficult for me to the point, to the point where they actually reorganized in late 2005, early 2006, they reorganized the entire directorate in which I was a senior manager. And when they finished reorganizing uh, that, that uh, part of NSA, I had no job. And I knew the handwriting was on the wall. So I had no money, I had no programs, I had no people, I had no executive assistant, I had an office and a flag and a desk and a computer. And so um, I had to make other arrangements. I ended up going down to the National Defense University where I became the NSA chair uh, teaching uh, the 
professor of behavioral science teaching strategic leadership and information strategies. So in 2005, the Eric Lichtblau, James Rison article comes out, revealing for the first time publicly uh, information that actually been withheld for 14 months prior to the 2004 presidential election. I just want to make that note. Revealing for the first time the existence of the so-called warrantless wiretapping program. Even that was just the tip of the iceberg. I knew there was a far, far deeper program, something that's now coming out, at least much of the additional contours of that program as it's grown by leaps and bounds over the intervening years uh, with the breaking news over the past week or so as we sit here in June of 2013. I knew there was a much deeper program, but, and there was one final avenue that I could exercise as an American citizen under the First Amendment and just go to the press. But going to the press was an extraordinarily fateful decision. The choice to go to the press meant that it was fraught with significant personal and professional peril. And the reason is because after the Risen and Lichtblau article was published in the New York Times in mid-December of 2005, two weeks later the Department of Justice launches a massive multi-year, multi-million dollar criminal national security quote-unquote leak investigation to find the sources. And I knew, I knew when that was announced with great fanfare within at NSA that I would ultimately get caught up. I already knew that in December of 2005, knew that. And the reason I knew that is because the, set, the number of people, the population of people that knew anything about the secret surveillance program, which was known as Stellar Wind, which is sort of the umbrella, although there's a number of others, um, secret surveillance programs, of which I gave critical information to, to Congress and others. It was a very small universe, a very small universe. And because I was, had been the executive program manager for ThinThread, it'd be a beeline target to me by virtue of association. But how, how would I make contact with a reporter? Because, because I also had other dirty knowledge. The other dirty knowledge that I had was as part of the secret surveillance program, programs at NSA, they had a special one that was literally spying on reporters and journalists on a very large scale. I knew that. And so I knew any kind of contact, whether it was um, going, actually going down to the offices of this particular reporter in Washington, D.C., or making normal, what I call normal electronic uh, communications contact, uh, would be instantly picked up. And so, but I made that decision. I made the decision because at this point, all the whistles I had blown had resulted in nothing happening. And uh, for the sake of the nation and for the sake of the future of this country and the Constitutional Republic, uh, I would be failing the oath that I took. Uh, I'd be in violation of the oath that I took if I did, did not take that one next fateful step, which was to go to the press. Now, it is true, there's, it is nothing, although people have, have said it, it isn't, there's nothing criminal about going to a reporter. NSA does have administrative uh, policies. To have unauthorized contact reporter is a violation. But it's an administrative violation, not a criminal violation. But I knew by doing so that I was putting my entire career in jeopardy. I knew that by doing so that I could easily lose my job. And I would lose my job because I could revoke or, su or suspend my clearance. And by having a suspended or revoked clearance, security clearance, as a condition of continuing employment, I would be unable to remain at NSA because I would be without that special badge, right? So um, I made that choice. I made that choice in early February. I still remember the moment when I made that choice. It was clear what, what I was going to do. But I, then it took a few weeks to sort out how I'd actually make contact with a reporter. And I did so anonymously because of what I knew NSA was doing within the United States. Um, and for the next year, I had contact, electronic anonymous contact, under highly encrypted means, uh, with that reporter. It wasn't until February of 2007 that I actually made contact with the reporter because at that time it was best that I do so. What I shared with the reporter 
with unclassified information regarding the secret surveillance programs and additional information regarding uh, the multi-billion dollar fraud of Trailblazer and critical unclassified information about ThinThread. The ThinThread was not only a superior intelligence system, it was not, it not, had not, it, all, it had, was also, had met all the requirements, the core requirements of Trailblazer, but it also fundamentally protected the rights of all Americans and in fact had the FISA rules built into it. Well, that was part, I never shared classified information of any kind with a reporter. Um, in fact, that was one of the ground rules with the reporter, that I would not, in fact, share actual classified. But I knew, I did know that by simply going to the reporter, the government would assume that I Probably starting with that day. In the spring of 2006, as this, well, this investigation at Times reporting in the summer of 2010, five full-time prosecutors were assigned, 25 full-time FBI agents. They were treating this uh, as a huge, huge, huge investigation. It was pretty significant. Uh, technically, the investigation continues to this day. Uh, that's never been formally declared. Uh, they've never formally declared that it, that it had been stopped. So in the spring of 2006, um, Diane Rourke, uh, who had been the House Permanent Select Committee Intelligence, um, she was the lead for, basically for the, she had the NSA programs as a professional staffer for five years. Um, let's just say the investigation had contacted um, her former committee and it was clear at that point in late April of 2006 that they were going to be uh, interviewing her. I think, believe the assumption was that the leak had to come from Congress and so that's where they s essentially started. I knew that meant the noose was starting to tighten, that by virtue of any and all um, contacts that I had clearly had uh, with, with Diane Warwick, both clandestinely and otherwise, that I would ultimately get caught up and it was a matter of, of when, not if. And sure enough, she was questioned uh, later uh, that summer uh, in 2006. And what I began to experience was severe retaliation within, um, within NSA I was in transition going down to the National Defense University. That was, okay, so I already, it was clear I needed to find other jobs and that, in that period I did. But then I began to experience uh, all kinds of electronic surveillance on a significant scale. It was like the surveillance system that I was intimately familiar with had now turned as part of its targeting on me as an American citizen. And although I've never divulged the full extent to what they did, it was clear uh, given my own significant uh, deep knowledge about internet and computers and networking equipment and routers, they were doing everything they can, not just to monitor me th and through my internet service provider, all my accounts, you name it. I, I was basically undercover, a blanket coverage of any and all electronic activity. Uh, later, they also, also began to physically surveil me, uh, as they, as, and that meant I was being tracked uh, to and fro, uh, and coming to and fro work, when I left home, when I returned, uh, all of my travels. Um, I, I would experience on a, on a more than just infrequent basis being stopped uh, at the gates of NSA's facilities and you know, right there as everybody's coming in and checking in, having you know, my trunk uh, lid lifted and all of my you know, articles searched inside the car um, over those intervening months. Um, in July of 2007, um, Diane and three former NSA colleagues associated with the Thin Thread program, interestingly enough, um, who were critical, critical players in Thin Thread, were the brains of Thin Thread, the business manager of Thin Thread, the IT uh, lead for Thin Thread, were um, summarily raided uh, by the FBI. And then I knew at that point it was just a matter of weeks or months. And so in November 28th of 2007, I was getting ready to go to the National Defense University. I was looking out of my bedroom window, and what did I see streaming across the front yard as cars were pulling up, a dozen uh, FBI agents uh, armed streaming across the front lawn. And the next thing I heard was a really loud knock. My son actually opened up the door. Um, as I remember as I came downstairs, his eyes were as large as saucers. I mean, he was like, whoa. Um, 
the nightmare had begun. What was going on? They served me with a search warrant. The search warrant was pretty clear. They believed that I was a source for the New York Times article. The fact that I had contact with a Baltimore Sun reporter was a red herring, um, although that was a tr certainly a triggering event. Right? They really thought that I was the source, and so I was, I was target number one uh, on their hit list. And for the next nine hours, they went through my entire house, top to bottom, looking for anything and everything they could find. And they went out with pretty much all my computers, any electronic media they could find, uh, locate, and a number, of, a number of papers, phone records, address books. Um, they actually took books from my library. It was quite extensive. I chose uh, to, um, I chose not to take, uh, you know, remember I don't have to testify against myself. I, you know, I've, um, I chose to um, cooperate with the FBI. And the reason I did was not because I was cooperating uh, is to, because I was afraid or because I was trying to work out some plea deal. I was cooperating with them because I wanted to report, once again, high crimes and misdemeanors. So it's important to note for, for the audience here that that was the last official time as a whistleblower that I reported government illegality and wrongdoing to directly to FBI agents who had served me with a warrant. They didn't want to hear about the crimes, high crimes and misdemeanors committed by the White House, the violations of federal acquisition regulations, uh, and the fact that there had been this incalculable loss of intelligence, or about the secret surveillance programs. They didn't want to hear about any of that. The reason they were there is because they considered any and all of those disclosures regarding government wrongdoing illegality as a crime. So now they're criminalizing me as a whistleblower. They're criminalizing truth-telling. So I cooperated with the FBI for five months, three separate occasions across 18 hours. None of it was recorded. Very convenient. I even asked them about that. Um, it would come back to haunt me when I was indicted two years later. But it's important to note for your audience that in April of 2008, I was in New York City clearing my head. I was, I was called by one of the FBI agents. By the way, this, the FBI was so serious about this uh, leak, the disclosure in the New York Times. They put the very best FBI unit on locating the leakers what they call the mole hunters. These are the ones that are specially trained to find real spies in America, not truth tellers or whistleblowers, okay? Just want to parenthetically note that. I was asked to um, show up at a classified FBI facility in the greater DC area. And when I arrived, they said, there's someone here to see you. I didn't know who that person was. It turned out I was a chief prosecutor on my case. And that conversation that he had with me uh, was, uh, to this day, um, I will always remember his face, his body language, and what he said. What came out of his mouth in that moment, everything I'd ever stood for, everything I ever lived for, the four times I'd taken the oath to defend the Constitution were now at stake because he said with great gravity, how would you like to spend the rest of your life in prison, Mr. Drake, unless you cooperate, start cooperating with our investigation? We have more than enough information and evidence to put you away for a long, long time. You better start talking. And I said, what's the evidence? He says, we have it. We're not going to show you, but we have it. And I knew in that moment, I knew in that moment, I just knew that my entire life was now um, forever altered. And I knew that I lived the distinct possibility that they're going to charge me with everything they could. Because the words they uttered talked about conspiracy and espionage. Okay and collaboration. 
These, is, these are all the language, these are all of the attributes that are normally assigned to the historical spies like Alger James and the David Hansons and the Alger Hisses. I'm now being lumped in. Now this is April of 2008, okay? So I had to seek um, legal representation, right? And so I acquired the services of a very good private attorney, very expensive private attorney, you know, $550 an hour. Uh, and although I did have some assets, you know, I was a senior executive, I was making $150,000 plus a year. Um, you know, I had money in the bank. Um, he told me uh, later that once you're indicted, um, a million to three million just to defend you. That was April 2008, so I acquired his services. A year later, they t attempted to force a formal plea agreement that if I didn't cooperate, uh, that I would be facing upwards of 20 years. Um, but there's no guarantee that it would be that, but it certainly wasn't gonna be, again, better than life, right? I rejected that uh, plea attempt, uh, a unilateral plea, plea agreement. Um, that was in May of 2009. Obama is become, is elected. He's now the president-elect in November. There was a meeting in which my lawyer attended. He thought everything was going to disappear. He thought this would all go away. I mean, Obama had made very eloquent statements during his 2000, uh, 2008 campaign and even comments preceding that about the, about the um, value of whistleblowers and who better to blow the whistle on government illegality and wrongdoing because they're there on the inside of the government and that we need to protect them. It's part of who we are as Americans. Little did I know that those are just empty words. Little did I know that he would launch historically the most unprecedented and relentless campaign against whistleblowers uh, that we have ever seen in this country. More, more indictments that have been brought against Americans than all other um, presidencies, administrations combined. So that's May, that's November the meeting, and they had another chief prosecutor. The one that was on my case was retiring. William Welsh was brought in, former head of the Office of Public Integrity, the team lead for the disaster of the Ted Stevens criminal case. Um, and in fact, he had stepped down in disgrace, but now he's being resurrected under his mentor, Eleni Brewer, who is now the head of the criminal division, and he was given, as it turns out, um, the whistleblower portfolio, okay? And my attorney knew then that they were not gonna drop it. And sure enough, Obama's now president. It's early 2000. Um, and um, it's now early, you know, that's, that's 2009, it's now, it's now early 2010, and he said, this prosecutor is taking a fresh look at the case, and it looks like you're gonna be indicted. And I was secretly charged at the same FBI facility, secretly charged, uh, in mar late March of 2010, and three weeks later, I was having lunch um, in Bethesda, I did not know this at the time. I get this frantic phone call from my lawyer who was not prone to frantic phone calls. He said, where are you? I said, I'm having lunch. He says, where are you? I said, I'm having lu lunch. He really repeated the question. He says, oh, you don't know it yet, do you? I said, no. So I just got a call from your, from your wife. Two security officers had come to her office. She's an NSA contractor, by the way. Had come to her office saying that your husband is about to be indicted for espionage. And he thought that I'd been pulled off the street and he was going to have to come, okay? And he'd post bail. He thought I might have been arrested. He was actually relieved to hear that I hadn't. So um, that splashed all across the news. Um, it was a huge deal. Uh, major figures of, within the intelligence community were weighing in with public statements, including Lanny Brewer, FBI officials. Um, and the real nightmare had begun. I now faced, it was 10 count indictment, uh, all felonies, five in the Espionage Act, one for obstruction of justice, four for making false statements to FBI agents. Uh, 35 years, upwards of 35 years in prison. And for the next 14 months, uh, 
I did everything I could to uh, keep myself free. But I knew that when I was indicted, that I was behind several eight balls. Um, I had no money left. Um, I ended up filing the form of paperwork uh, before the federal district court in Baltimore, and I was declared indigent before the court, which meant they appointed federal public defenders. It turned out I had the federal public defender for Maryland as well as, uh, as, well as the, uh, the assistant public defender. Um, but I knew that I couldn't just defend myself in the federal court system, especially with the gravity of the charges against me, especially the Espionage Act charges. Um, the first person, I was only the fourth person had been charged um, with mishandling information. First was Daniel Ellsberg, okay, of Pentagon Papers fame. So here I am lumped in with the Ellsbergs, but I'm also lumped in because I'm charged on the espionage with all the spies in U.S. history. A World War I era statute is now being used to uh, shut me down. Um, and it's the worst thing an American can be painted with. You're a traitor, you've committed treason, you're a Benedict Arnold, oof, wow, you're a turncoat. And so I knew I was gonna have to find a way to prevail in the court of public opinion and a few short days after I was indicted, I read this remarkable article in the, in the uh, LA Times written by Jesslyn Radak um, at the Government Accountability Project. And I realized, here's someone that actually gets it. Here's someone that also had experienced the full wrath of the Department of Justice. And she realized that although she was never indicted, that being indicted under the Espionage Act was pretty serious but that what I did was whistleblowing. It was not leaking. And so um, I, ended up, I contacted the Government Accountability Project and Justin Radak uh, led the remarkable team at GAP and in partnership with others, coalition partners, uh, to, turn, um, to turn the public opinion uh, in my, f my favor, but it took tremendous effort um, over, over the intervening uh, 13 months from May of 2010 until June of 2011 to make that happen. Uh, I can't thank Gap and Jessalyn on her extraordinary uh, leadership and legal acumen for making that critical difference. She became my voice when I had none. Uh, she defended me and the court of public opinion from early on, uh, practically single-handedly uh, when no one else was there. And the reason is when you're charged with the Espionage Act, even those you would think would be your natural allies were in a hands-off posture because espionage is pretty serious. And I hadn't even had close family members saying, gee, Tom, you know, what the heck did you do? Why would the government charge you with espionage, of all things? Um, you took oaths, you know, it's, you know, you signed agreements, all this. Um, Gap was absolutely, under Justin Radak's leadership, absolutely vital um, in the court of public opinion. Uh, I could not have had the extraordinary victory uh, in holding off the government uh, that I did um, in June of 2011 if it had not been for Gap and, and uh, Jesslyn. There's just no question. It would have been much more difficult. The, uh, the hurdles that I would have to have climbed, as much as it was the critical defense, and I, not only the public defenders, did an extraordinary job holding off a Department of Justice that had thrown everything they had against me uh, before the judge. Um, I mean, it's an extraordinary period. Um, there's voluminous filings in my case. Um, De Ellsberg uh, ultimately uh, prevailed. Um, the strategic communications campaign that Justin Radak led um, was phenomenal because ultimately what it did bring on were other others who realized that I was a whistleblower, realized that I had disclosed critical public interest information about government illegality and wrongdoing and massive fraud, waste, and abuse. And, and in terms of the intelligence, you know, threats to public safety. Um, in fact, that we would actually further weaken national security as opposed to strengthening it by the very actions that the government was conducting in secret, um, where there's no room in a democracy for, for such secret decisions, um, when it's certainly when it's not in the best interests of the United States. And so, as we went into 2011, oh, and by the way, it's important to note the government, I mean, it was, 
they were all in on this one with me. I was going to be the example, the exhibit number one, which would drive the stake of national security through me and then prop me out in public for all to see. This is what happens. I knew that my case was extremely significant. I knew that if they did prevail, it would set the most dangerous of precedents uh, in this country. They would essentially establish the basis for secret courts, secret evidence, secret, additional secret law against, against individuals. And that, the, and that the fundamental justice system would, would, be, uh, would, would be further corrupted and corroded by virtue of my case alone. It was clear that Obama was letting all of this go forward to ensure that anybody that would dare speak truth to or of power would be hammered and hammered good. And if it meant permanent incarceration for decades or, or even up to and including life, so be it. In March, late March of 2011, during the final um, motions hearing, which was public, the chief prosecutor went so far as to say, before the court uh, and before both counsels and before the public, and there was a number of reporters and journalists there, because they realized that was a significant hearing, because so few of them were public, most of them were all behind closed doors. The chief prosecutor actually, actually uh, had the hubris and arrogance to say that what I did endangered the lives of American soldiers. That's just one statement away from aiding the enemy, which is a capital offense. Okay? That's how serious the government was. Uh, fortunately, uh, the case collapsed under the weight of the truth, the extraordinary uh, turn in the court of public opinion. Um, the Ridenauer was a recipient of the 2011 Ridenauer Truth Telling Prize, where I f f first spoke uh, in my own voice uh, while still facing public trial that was scheduled to begin on June 13th of 2011. Um, the Jane Mayer, uh, it is the most seminal article on, on my case to date, The Secret Share, it was front page in The New Yorker uh, in May, followed right after by, by a, uh, at the top of the, um, the final, it was actually the final 60 minutes for the season, at the top of the hour, um, a 60 minutes piece um, on, on me. And so um, then some back-to-back, -back, uh, and of course, in this time, whole time period, lots of op-eds are being published, lots of articles are being published. It's fever, white, hot pitch now is being focused on, on, on my, the entirety of my case. Uh, the Washington Post weighs in from, with two very powerful uh, op-eds about a, a government, you know, we might have an interest here, and maybe, you, you know, you really is a whistleblower, and maybe you're just overreaching a bit here. Um, and so in the last frenzy week prior to the scheduled public trial, the government actually approached the public defenders and said, we'd like to enter into plea negotiations uh, with, with the defendant. Um, I was not inclined to do so. They had put me through hell. Uh, they had turned my life inside out. They destroyed me personally and professionally on a scale that I have yet to disclose publicly. Um, and here I was um, still facing public trial. And they had not dropped. They had not dropped any of the charges. And so I'll say here again, as I've, I've, been, I've said it in other fora, I said the only, the only way I'll even enter into any kind of negotiations with no guarantees that, I, that I'll accept is you must drop all the charges. You drop every single felony count, right? right? Every single one of them. Uh, they ultimately agreed to do that, but they still wanted to prevail on, on a felony count. And the details of that are extraordinary, that those final uh, six days, um, and so on Thursday, the Thursday prior, late afternoon on Thursday prior to the scheduled uh, public trial, they had already uh, impaneled the jurors, they had already sent out subpoenas, everything was ready to go as far as, as, far as public trial. Um, I, I was able to negotiate on my terms um, a plea agreement where they dropped all of the 10 felony counts. I pled out to a minor misdemeanor under the Computer Fraud and Abuse Act for exceeding authorized use of computer did not involve any class of information, didn't involve any unauthorized okay, contact, um, and no fines, and uh, no, that was the agreement, no fine, no jail time. There was a pro forma sentencing before the judge uh, on July 15th of 2011, and um, my, my, uh, I was where I was sentenced, uh, one year probation and 240 hours of community service, and one of the silver linings in all of this, acknowledging, of course, I accepted the guilt for my, civil, uh, my act of civil disobedience. 
Um, obviously, I had access to NSA systems. I had access to information that was quote unquote privileged. Um, but what I had shared on the outside was all unclassified. Um, so it was an extraordinary victory. Uh, I salute the Government Accountability Project and the um, extraordinary uh, leadership of Justin Radak and, and everybody that was part of the team in which we ultimately prevailed against the Department of Justice and I remain free to this day. I um, interviewed uh, almost 50 veterans, silver lining, from World War II all the way to the present day. Extraordinary set of interviews in support of the Library of Congress Veterans History Project. It's part of my community service. The judge had assigned me uh, to, he actually had me report, officially report, as part of the sentencing uh, to uh, Fort Detrick uh, in Frederick, Maryland. And when I went there, they looked at my military record um, and they said, how would you like to interview veterans? We've, it's rare that we ever get someone that can dedicate that many hours. And that's, that was the only time I went there. Um, the rest of the, my community service was literally doing video interviews. Uh, and some of the most remarkable ones, they're being posted and filed with the Library of, of Congress's Veterans History Project. It's just extraordinary insights from veterans um, going back to World War II. It's critically important. It's crucial to have a voice. It's crucial to have advocacy. It's crucial to have a network of those who can go to bat for you. It's crucial to have all of the critical players that understand uh, what whistleblowing is all about and why it's so crucial to our, our form of democracy um, and keeping it a democracy. In the case of our country, our form of, gov of government is a constitutional republic. You know, absent whistleblowing, how do you hold the system to account? Um, there's very few protections, and even the protections that currently, currently exist um, uh, don't necessarily um, create a whole, lot of <laughs> a whole lot of comfort for those who would, would become whistleblowers. Um, the government has certainly uh, shown itself in these the last number of years, um, we just want to punish them. Uh, in fact, it's, I just find it remarkably hypocritical that Obama's own 2012 uh, campaign platform calls out, uh, you know, they brag that they brought more cases, national security cases against whistleblowers and truth tellers, all they call them leakers, of course, than all other, all other, they're bragging more than all other administrations combined, like somehow that's a good thing. It's a good thing, right? It just stands in stark contrast to his comments in, from four years, you know, four years earlier. Uh, and so, no, I, and it's important to have that representation. Um, without it, uh, it's extremely difficult for whistleblower to prevail. It's already a very lonely thing to blow the whistle. And when you have the government with all of its resources, you know, you've got to have those who can serve in your own best interests to just to deal with it. Uh, and that's, on, that's across the, all fronts. That's the legal, the, you know, the media, the advocacy, the support, and, and the extended network. Uh, the critical thing in my case, that what was ostensibly a mishandling classified, uh, unauthorized contact with a reporter, um, keeping documents, national defense classified uh, for the purpose of disclosure to people unauthorized to receive them, uh, went to, I was a whistleblower. And I recognized the gravity and I continue to realize, and as others do, that by holding off the government, uh, it was a significant and compelling victory. Uh, for, for uh, not just whistleblowing, but for freedom of the press and the First Amendment. My case was ultimately always about the First Amendment. It was. It's quite remarkable that during the pendency of my trial, the government actually filed form formal motions to eliminate as relevant or admissible anything related to my whistleblower history, anything related to uh, the First Amendment activities, and anything related to classification over classification. Um, the one, and this is even as late as March, just to show you that tide turning in the last remaining three, three uh, those, those remarkable uh, two and a half months, the April, May, early June timeframe, even as late as March during the final motions hearing, the only organization that filed a friend of the court brief was the Government Accountability Project. And the very first action that the judge, Richard Bennett, took, the presiding judge, in my criminal case, in the Federal District Courthouse in Baltimore, the first action that he took was, 
is there anybody here from the Government Accountability Project? And Jesslyn stood up, said, yes, I am. And he accepted. He found it of note. And the reason that that, that was a critical filing, okay, as a friend of the court brief, is because it provided the core argument that I had always been and had always remained a whistleblower. Contrary to the government meme and the government propaganda and the government story. Given my own experiences with the gap, it's you know, an unconditional um, recommendation. Um, I can only say the highest things about if, about the government accountability project. You know, there are con gaps considered is recognized as the leading whistleblower advocacy and support organization uh, in in the country. Is also recognized increasingly uh, on the international uh, level, um, and I only have the highest of accolades. Um, they, they, as I've said in other fora, um, they kick far above their, uh, or you say box far above their weight class when it comes to dealing, uh, you know, with the government, um, way above their weight class for being such a small organization. In fact, I have te people that tell me they think there's like teams and teams of lawyers here because how, how could they have done so well uh, for you, Tom, as well as others? Um, and they're at the epicenter. The uh, gap is certainly at the epicenter. Um, in this, this just unrelenting campaign against uh, truth and control of information. And so, um, yeah, it's, it's, it's a recommendation. I would advise any, anybody that's thinking about being a whistleblower or considering a whistleblower or has become a whistleblower to make direct contact. Um, because GAP, it's not just GAP by itself. GAP is in partnership with any number of other organizations and um, the leverage that they have, the access, the synergy that's created can bring to bear um, um, a whole lot of, of not just visibility, but voice, reason, support, um, you know, legal support um, mechanism. My entire, I mean, I can only imagine the cost, you know, Gap had actually charged me and I had to pay for it, but it was all pro bono. I mean, this is one of the advantages GAP provides that because when you're whistleblower, by the time, often as I did, you're already broken, you're already bankrupt, you have no money left. Um, so. You know, it's interesting. I've been asked that question recently in light of uh, Edward Snowden uh, just coming forward, as it turns out, uh, as an NSA whistleblower. Regarding extraordinary, regarding extraordinary um, revelations, of which were no surprise to me, right? But the extraordinary revelations, secret surveillance world of, of NSA in particular, um, I would do it again. There's a few things I would have done differently. I would have done differently. That's true. I would not have spoken with the FBI under any circumstances at all. Total waste of time. Uh, in fact, I don't recommend any, under any circumstances. I would, have, I would have gotten an attorney much, much sooner, and I would have reached out almost immediately to a whistleblower support organization uh, like the Government Accountability Project.